you know, yesterday, for instance, we saw Canada standing up on the, the Buy American clause, for instance, and now on privacy. Is there any concern that, you know, pushback from Canada maybe might get a reaction in the States and that there could be consequences when Canadians try to cross the border, for instance, if they're not willing to cooperate with some mm -hmm. of the requirements to give information? Well, there are consequences already. Uh, you mean the, what we're trying, what the government is trying to deal with here is really the consequences of unilateral action by the United States up until now. What they're trying to negotiate is a bilateral agreement that will hopefully mitigate some of those consequences. I do not think that in effect the agreement in terms of this kind of balancing between security and privacy information against a freer border is a balance that should be taken. The, free bo the border activities are justified on their own merits and initially the security transfer of security information was justified on their own merits as well. But here you're putting the two together and you're going to sell one in order to buy something on the other side. That's really what's unique about this, uh, this particular arrangement. And I don't think anybody who's ever been involved in Canada-US relations have ever seen something like this before. What's your motivation to write a, a report like that? Are you... Uh worry about the uh, Canadian democracy or uh, I I've always been worried about Canada. I'm Newfoundlander, so my parents voted to become part of Canada. So, <laughs> uh, and that was a long time ago, but I still remember the debates that went on in Newfoundland because Newfoundland, a lot of Newfoundlanders thought that they had given up something that was very rare in this day of life, in, in our lives. Uh, but yet, uh, we did. And, uh, and I think in terms of joining the public service, working for the public service for 42 years of Canada, I think I've always been concerned about issues of Canadian public policy and how it's carried out and I don't think uh, you mean there's always and I don't have to talk to you guys here you mean you're part of the you're part of the chorus here in this church but you know we uh, uh, public policy can always be made better and I think one of the checks of that we have I think one of the great checks I think in in uh, in, in in Canada is that as private citizens we can stand up we can talk about issues that we know something about and hopefully we can then uh, Canadians become aware of what our concerns are and I think privacy is the essence of our democracy and the threat against privacy you know, I mean is 99.9% .9 as a result of government action so uh, do you fear that we're selling away our sovereignty in a way by giving away all this information to the US oh absolutely yeah this is you know, I mean if you cannot control the information that is available about your citizens that the government collects and you give it to another authority, another government, then that is, you're selling one of the great essences of sovereignty. Mr. Staples, a question for you. Um, uh, uh, why do you feel that uh, Canada will be shortchanged uh, um, in terms of privacy rights and uh, theoretical benefits on a more open border? I, I think that the, um, uh, I have seen precious little evidence that there's any connection between security arrangements and liberalization of trade. I, I think that, that there's an assumption that you, there's something, uh, there's a linkage between doing something over here on security issues, sharing information, that kind of thing, and then we're going to somehow rescue NAFTA and we're going to have the borders open up. Uh, that's the basic philosophy of this kind of agreement that's being put into it. And I think, as Gar Party has pointed out, it's very unique uh, that this is not typically how things are done. You deal with them issue by issue. So, so uh, uh, and there's plenty of, there's plenty of uh, evidence to the contrary over the last few years. For instance, um, uh, we went into Afghanistan at the request of the United States, and we felt that this was pro con contributing to North American security, yet we weren't able to avoid the passports requirements at the border. Uh, on the flip side, we did not join the, uh, directly the uh, invasion of Iraq, um, uh, but uh, we still had access to some of the reconstruction contracts uh, when the British were having problems and they had gone in. So I just think that these issues are dealt with in separate spheres. My concern is that this government is going to go down there, negotiate a bad deal, uh, give up all kinds of things in terms of security and, and privacy um, to the U.S., and get nothing in return. And then if something else happens, we're right back to square one again, and we are much further behind. So I think that the, the government <clears throat> should be dealing with it. If it's a border issue, 
keep it as a border issue, deal with infrastructure, deal with that kind of thing, as long as that sovereignty of Canada and our privacy uh, can be maintained. That's fine. See if there's uh, some kind of logistical way. But don't get into these grand deals where we think we're going to share databases and uh, entry exit records and all this kind of thing uh, in the hope that our trucks are going to get over the border faster. Majority, you, we, you, you're not expecting any transparency, are you? Certainly I am. I don't think that uh, we didn't elect a king. Uh, we, uh, we, we still live in a, in a parliamentary democracy and there's still an obligation, uh, even with the majority government, that uh, Canadians be consulted and that there's transparency. And uh, this, uh, we have seen, I think, a number of attempts, as, as Gar Party mentioned, over the last 10 years. Some of these things have gone under, under the radar and a lot of these changes in this integration has happened. There have been other attempts, such as the SPP and various other agreements, that have typically fallen apart over the last few years for a number of reasons. Some it's the change of personalities, different administrations come and go. But uh, largely there's just an environment of distrust around these things uh, that make it impossible for them to move forward. And it's because of the lack of transparency on many of these negotiations. And a sense that, you know, for instance, on some of these announcements last February, uh, Canadians didn't know what was going on, Parliament parliamentarians didn't know what was going on, but yet Foreign Affairs held a special briefing for CEOs of major firms that have cross-border dealings. So, you know, it's that kind of attitude and, and uh, uh, tactics that uh, make people, I think, suspicious, rightfully so. Do you not consider should not be complete transparency when you're dealing with border security. I mean, part of the point is to try and strengthen things so that people don't, the people who have bad intentions don't get away with it. And if they know everything that is being done, then that would be make it easier to circumvent those practices. <clears throat> sure, I think I think there's got to be a balance, but I think that it, it's about the approach. Uh, in terms of security and, and, and uh, transparency. I, I think that the attitude has to be, why should we keep this secret, rather than why should we make this public, uh, which I think is the way it's going now. So the, the onus, I think the general view in the government, and Gar, you may have an idea of this as a, a, a opinion on this as well, is that generally they sort of, the default is keep everything secret unless they're compelled to, to make it uh, public rather than the other way around. And I think this is an attitude that's actually more prevalent in the U.S. They're, it's a much more open, even in the, on the U.S. side, uh, that they go more go of an attitude of, well, why should we keep this secret? Uh, generally, it should be more the other way around. Just one additional comment. I think the, the underlying philosophy here, and always has been, I think, in criminal matters, I think in certainly in common law countries, is that uh, you don't uh, do preventive detention. You, mean, you don't lock people up on some idea that maybe they're going to do something bad down the road. One has got to be very careful. One starts on that. As you know, already uh, the Prime Minister has indicated that he's going to try to restore one of the elements in the uh, Anti-Terrorism Act of, uh, of 2001. Uh, and that's a, a preventive detention measure is what we're talking about here. Uh, the Americans have one in their law and the Americans, other people have gone to preventive detention. But let me tell you is that once you start getting into preventive detention for, of your own citizens, you're really on a slippery slope here with regards to law enforcement and support from your public. Okay. 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 Yep. Thank you so much. Thank you.